Welcome to our last lecture of the BCH 2024 course. How are you guys doing? Hope that you guys are, are doing okay. Um, let me start asking if you guys have any questions about um, summer number five, which is due tonight. How is it going with that? Okay, looks like you guys are in good shape then. Uh, we will have one final assignment that I'm going to be presenting today. That will be due in, in two weeks from now, meaning on the 24th. Um, although this is our last lecture, we are going to still have the office hours. Um, by the way, next office hours, which should be on Friday, I may need to change that, but I will guys let you know by, by email if that's the case. Uh, if that's the case, probably I can move it to either Thursday or, or Monday. Um, I don't know what do you guys prefer. If you prefer to have it before the weekend or after the weekend. Um, the, assi the assignment should be pretty, pretty straightforward, though. Um, but if you guys have any preference, please do let me know. In any case, we're going to talk about that after the, um, uh, the lecture. So... If you guys don't have any questions about the previous lectures or, or the assignment, then we are going to, to start lecture number 12, um, which as I didn't get any, any feedback, I decided to do uh, high performance R, which I think it goes more along the lines of programming. That's what I think the, the course entitled originally. So, um, um, so let's, let's get started with that. Let me share my, uh, my screen. Okay, so that you guys can see that. All right. So as I mentioned, um, we are going to be talking about high performance R. Uh, so and there are a couple of, of topics I would like to discuss here. Uh, so high performance includes several things or different things. Uh, and, and, and a few of them, not all of them, but a few of them are related to memory management, which means how much memory are, are we going to use? And that is kind of well, uh, but bad known because of its memory management. We, we saw some of these, for instance, when we were creating or trying to create a large replica of an array or even um, appending to an array, something that R does uh, for us is kind of uh, create a, a, a intermediate uh, duplication of this memory allocation. So that is not so good. The other thing we're going to be talking about is profiling, meaning we need to measure uh, different metrics, different things to know, okay, how, how well our code is, is performing in terms of speed, in terms of memory utilization, different, different uh, criteria. So that's give you different metrics to evaluate how, how, is, how fast or slow or good or bad um, a call behaves. And then we are going, the last part is, talking about launching parallel processes now. We haven't talked about that. Some things are easy to do. Some things are a little bit more complicated. And finally, how to include compile language, which makes uh, actually really good use of the speed in the microprocessors in, in the computers. So let's get started with uh, the first part. And just, and just a disclaimer or, 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 or recall that R is what we call an interpreter language. We talk about this in our very first lecture, uh, which means at the time that there is an extra layer of infrastructure, which is called the interpreter. It's another program running underneath um, that is needed to actually execute our scripts. So in general, I would say interpreter languages such as R, Python, Bash, Per, um, MATLAB, if you wish, uh, are not considered really high performance language because this extra layer of infrastructure. Um, this implies, as we discussed at the time, 
the interpreter will need to check that the variables that you are using are the proper ones to implement the operation you want to do. Uh, it also needs to deal with dynamic variable allocation, meaning that if you decide to rename a, a variable or take a variable and convert from strings to numbers, uh, the, the interpreter has to be okay with that. So all that, all that baggage carried by the interpreter makes it not really high performance in terms of speed and memory utilization. So true high performance languages are what we call compiled languages. And these are uh, uh, languages such as C, C++, uh, Fortran. Uh, so those languages don't have any of these commodities that we just mentioned, the dynamical type variables, or, or, or they don't check if the variables that you are using to perform a given operation are the proper ones. They assume you know uh, they are the right ones, and then if they don't, the code just break. So all those things uh, make the, those languages faster because they don't have those protections in place. Uh, having said all that, there are ways to making are not quite so bad, and this is what we're going to be discussing today. So let's just start by talking uh, about R and memory. Uh, so one thing that I don't remember if we mentioned this, I, I think we, we may have mentioned this during the functions class, is that R passes by value, which means that the variables that are passed into a function or, or, or the arguments of the function uh, are going to be modified directly by the function if they are modifying the function. Meaning if I have a variable that I pass into the function, and this function doesn't modify the variable itself, means that it only takes the value and do something with the values, then that is passed by value. Means that it just, it just takes um, the, the variable, the value, it creates a copy and operates on that. Now, what, what happens is if the, if the function modifies the variable, it says, let's say it's an uh, increment something or updates the variable, then that function, that variable is passed by reference. So it doesn't create a copy. So this distinction makes R behave differently than other languages and makes actually R behave differently depending on the function that executes and the variables that are used. So the important thing to remember is that in some cases you will end up with a temporary copy of the variable and then again can increase the memory footprint. That is a slow, but more importantly, it can push you to the limits of the memory in the hardware on the computer where you're running and maybe even crash your code because you run out of memory. Now, what R does to deal with situations with this is something called garbage collection. And this is a big theory in computer science is, okay, if there is a language that creates dynamic, uh, dynamically variables that are needed for temporary use or intermediate use, then the language has to clean up. Those, those additional variables. Now, sometimes it's more complicated than just a case where you call a function because you know when the function is, is uh, ends, then you can remove all those intermediate variables. But then if you have this in part of your main call or your function takes too long, then you can be hitting those limits in memory without the chance to clean up. So the, the theory of, of garbage collection has to deal with, this, with these things. Now, the interesting thing is, because this is a known issue, um, and R runs the garbage collector every certain time, there is also a way for you to explicitly call the garbage collector, and this is by calling the GC function. It stands for garbage collector, obviously. Um, but, but the important thing is to keep in mind that these mechanisms are in place and that you can execute the garbage collection whenever you, you, you think it's needed. Like for instance, you are duplicating an array and then you know that you need to clean, you can, you can invoke this. And we're going to see some examples of how this works in a sec. So this is, this is the uh, garbage collector and a few more useful memory management commands. So GC, as I say, stands for garbage collector. If you do uh, verbose equal true or GC equal true, then you, you uh, probably are going to, to get more information. It means that it will display information in the output. LS, I think we saw LS, it lists all the existing variables as strings. And then the other one is object size and given a variable name. So object size uh, basically returns the size of a given object. So for instance, if, if we are creating a replica of a, of a given array, then we can say, okay, how, how much memory this array is, is actually used, okay? 
Now, the interesting one is RM, which stands for remove. So that deletes a variable that you don't uh, no longer need. Um, so for instance, this, this one liner, which uses one of our uh, good friends, the supply function, what does is it leaves, it takes as an argument, the list of all the variables in, 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 in memory currently defined, and then defines what we call, I think we saw this uh, inline function, which gets the, the, the size of the given variables produced or returned by the LS function. And then it sorts them in a decreasing order. So it sorts them from larger to, to a smaller. So this is a function that can be useful sometimes to, to maybe you, you can uh, rename it as, as, as sort variables or something. And it will show you all the objects that you have defined in, in, in memory at the moment and, and list them by, by size. So for instance, let me see, let me show you how, how does it look the GC, um, the GC output. So when you run GC in your, in your environment, in your R terminal, it will look more or less like this. And it's, it's a little bit technical, but we can go through this. So it looks, it shows the N cells and B cells. So the B cells are memory associated with vector type objects, can be vector, can be list, and the N cells are associated with all other type of variables and functions definitions. And then it tells you how much is used in, in bytes and in megabytes, sorry, in, in number of cells uh, corresponding to the objects and then in megabytes. When the garbage collector is triggered, so it means that the garbage collector will, will start kicking in to clean up things when it reaches 21.8 megabytes and seven megabytes for, for vectorized objects. And what is the maximum use? What was the maximum use at a given point in this interactive session? Now, as I told you, we can define some, some um, auxiliary functions here just to explore the utilization of memory. One of them is get mem. So it basically gets you the first column of the garbage collector output. So it's calling the function is called GC and it gives you uh, the first two columns. And then we can say, okay, what is all mem? What is the current status of the memory before performing any other operation? Get the memory. Then we are going to create a vector X, which has, uh, I think, 16 million elements. And then uh, we're going to get the size of the vector X. And you can see the size in bytes. One of the th nice things of getting the information directly from the memory is that we can define with the print function to get uh, the units in a given unit. More, more legible, if you wish, in this case, megabytes. So we can see that this is 2000, 2048 megabytes or almost two gigabytes of RAM by creating this vector of, uh, of basically all zeros. Now, if I get, uh, if I use this get mem function for getting the new memory and I subtract new mem versus all mem, I re recall we are looking just at the first two columns of the, of the output of GC, what we get is the difference that it was created just in the vector type object because we're using rep here. And it's, as we were, as we were saying before, 2048 megabytes or two gigabytes of, of memory. So again, some, some basic uh, memory gymnastics, you wish, or memory management, uh, just to keep, to keep an idea. Now, if, if we use the RM function for removing that object, let's say that object was something that we needed for an intermediate calculation, and then we get the final memory with the get mem function. Now we can see that at least most of the of the of the memory has has gone back to 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 zero. So the B cells are again roughly at zero point zero megabytes. There are always some leftovers. Uh, think about these things like when you run the history function that it remembers what type of commands you have done. It may be depending on the functions that you execute some leftovers, or it may be that they just the garbage collector hasn't kicked in to clean up some intermediate uh, auxiliary variables or functions needed. So again, it's not always perfect. You will not always recover depending on the situation, exactly the same memory as you started with, but the big chunks like the 2,000 two megabytes are, are basically gone by using R. Okay. Any, any questions so far about this? Okay. So this is mostly about memory manipulation. There are other things that you can do with memory manipulation. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much detail because each of these topics may 
they serve one or two lectures themselves. I just wanted to show you some of them and some of the um, main features or main annoyances, depending on how you look at it. Uh, but things like when you run out of memory and you don't have enough memory to process data, what can you do? Well, there are packages that can help with that. Uh, one of them is the big memory package or big matrix package, which utilizes underneath big memory. Um, at the end, I have a few more resources that you can explore if you're interested in going down this row. Um, but just as I say, this is more, more of a, a, a show off of the things that, that are related to high performance in, in terms of how you will do it with that. Now, the other thing I mentioned, which is super important, I think some of you, um, can't remember, but I'm pretty sure some of you were playing with profiling, maybe without using the term, playing with profiling your codes, especially when you run the Monte Carlo simulation. I think some of you were concerned that the uh, infectious propagation of the disease was taking too long in each iteration, so you were measuring some things, and at least I remember someone doing that. And, and this falls under the category of profiling. So the idea here is, okay, how we can improve the performance of the code without not knowing how it performs itself, how, how it runs, runs fast, runs slow. Well, fast and slow with respect to that. So the idea here is, okay, we need to profile, that's the technical term, profile measure, how the code uh, performs in order to see if we can improve or if of the performance is detrimental depending on a new implementation or a new change we have done. So um, one of the things we can do is we can profile using the time metric. And what it means is, okay, uh, basically measure how fast the code runs, how long it takes to run, what part of the codes are, are the slowest, which are the fastest. Um, another thing is testing how long individual functions can take um, to, to, to run uh, using what we call the micro benchmark package, uh, or even more crudely, the system uh, time, that is kind of a watch clock that you can uh, uh, just start from the system. We are going to see examples of this. And also testing the whole program using the RProf package. So we're going to see some examples of each of these. But bear in mind, this is just profiling in terms of speed, uh, in terms of running time, how long a program or a code takes to run. There are other, other metrics that one can consider, but in this case, we are going to just focus on this. Okay? So how do we profile individual functions? So I mentioned there is the system.time command, which uses the operating system time command underneath. Um, the micro benchmark function is more systematic. It takes an average of 100 calls of your functions and then average over all these calls. Uh, now the micro benchmark package, you need to install it. It's, it's an additional package, but it's a very standard package. So it shouldn't, it shouldn't get into any trouble. But let's see an example of this, of each of these two. So I'm going to define a function f here that it basically does nothing. It just takes no arguments. It defines an, a variable a, and then it loops over, what is that, 100 million elements or 100 million iterations. And then what it does is just take a and add to the previous value of a uh, the corresponding value of this, of this sequence. And we were, all what we're going to do is just measure how long this variable, this function, sorry, takes to run. So we're going to use, first use the system.time function, and we are just calling the function here. Now, the system.time function re reports three quantities, three different times. One is what we call the user time, the other is the system time, and the other is the lapse time. The lapse time is nothing else than the addition of the user plus the system time. This is an interesting distinction, though, between the, the, the times reported because the user time reports the actual time that the function, your user function, took to run. But the system time are related uh, to things that the operating system is doing. And in most of the case, as you can see here, it's very tiny, the fraction. But in some cases, it can be, uh, it can be a, a, a substantial amount of time depending on what you're doing. So what I mean is, if your function, for instance, has to read or write files to this, then that contribution appears in the system time. And sometimes, as I say, that can be the dominant part of the total time of the function, and that is why it's, it's added. So this is a good indication when we are running into what we call uh, IO bound uh, programs or calls, where most of the time is spent in, in, in system calls, 
for reading or writing. Fact, we talk about this in the file IO lecture, right? That that's the most uh, demanding or, or most expensive part in any program. But the system dot time call is very simple. You just call the function as you will do it. Only that around the system dot time call, and basically that reports how long it takes to run. Now a separate approach is to use the library micro benchmark. A micro benchmark works very much as system dot time. The only thing is it calls just the function, and now it says, okay, the units I'm going to be reporting this is seconds because it can take multiple functions. It says which function is being executed, and it says which is the minimum and the maximum time. You see that the more or less concise and, and, and the average more or less concise, and the maximum um, is a little bit above, but, but it's close. So what is different here is that the, the micro benchmark function ran 100 times by default the function f, and then it took the minimum, the maximum, and the average of that time. So it's a little bit more robust in terms of reporting uh, the statistics of, of having uh, profiled this function. But it's very simple to implement. So any, any questions about this? You may wonder why not using always the micro benchmark instead of the system time? Well, I, I, I tell you why. If you are really in, in the presence of a quite demanding function, meaning it takes maybe hours or, or hopefully not days, but for sure hours to run, and you want to have a very quick estimate of, of how long it takes, well, you can use system time. It will give you just from one run. Uh, now, if you, if you want a more robust result because you're reporting times in, in a paper or, or, or trying to do something more, more thoroughly, then you, you may want to consider micro benchmark. But obviously, it will take 100 times longer than, than, than just running system time. Okay. Now, I mentioned there is a third way to measure this, uh, and this is when you want to profile a whole code. So we saw how to profile functions calls. But let's say that you want to profi profile your whole code. Um, there is this thing called rprof. And again, we're going to define another function here, add me, which is which in this case takes two arguments, A and B, and then returns the addition of A plus B. Nothing too profound here. We are not after you know, very, very meaty functions, but just examples of how to, to, to measure these functions. And then we're going to define another function called test, which is that initialize A with one, and then it loops over again, 100 million uh, iterations, and then um, call the add me function, 100 million iterations. So what we are going to do is for profiling the whole program, this is similar to what you will do if you want to profile the calls to your main driver scripts, you will start rprof with a given name. In this case is rprof.data. By the way, this will generate a file containing the, the information from the outputs, from, from the performance or the profile in this case of, of whatever we run after calling this function in a file called rprof.data. Now this rprof.data is going to be a binary file and then we are going to process. Uh, and I'll show you in the next slide how to do that. And then what you do after this first line of calling the or initializing your profiler is to call your function. So in this case, our main driver script function will be test. So you call test and then you, you shut down the profiler using rprof null. So when you set the name to null, then the profiling stops. So whatever was between rprof, the name of the file and rprof null is what is going to be profiled, okay? So how we recover the data, because as I told you, you dump it into this binary file and, and you can check it out, you can try to look at the file, it's going to be uncomprehensible because it's just binary code. Well, we can use the function summary rprof and summary rprof will take the name of the file where you store the profiling information. So in this case, summary rprof, rprof data, put that into a variable s, and then you can start to explore this. This is a data frame that is composed by all the information acquired during this process. So we can look at by total. Uh, so the summary in the column or, or the slice by total will show the test function, the admin, and then some anonymous functions that are probably the calls within the for loop. It will show the total time, the percentage time, the self time, and the self percentage time. So let me explain this a little bit. So the total time is the actual total time in, in seconds in this case, or microseconds, I think, I believe it's seconds though. 
uh, the total percentage time is from this total time, how much was spent in this function. And because the main driver function is, is test, it's natural that the total percentage time is 100 because the, to the test function was always present in memory when running. Now, the army function that was the one called within the iterations, it was only 42% 40, of the time, meaning that the loop itself took some time. So 13.72 seconds were calls to the ADMI function. And you can see that then the other was all the bookkeeping and iterations done in the full loop. Okay, so this is again, interesting way to, to see the whole performance. And you can, as, as you can see, you can profile several functions, the whole program at once by using this approach. So some, some quick comments about our prof. Uh, our pro samples every uh, the whole program every 20 milliseconds by default. Uh, so you, you need to bear this in mind depending how, how long it takes your program to run. You may need to adjust this, this interval um, so that you have a good sampling. Uh, basically, that's what it's doing. It's sampling in which part of the functions of the program uh, each line is being executed and then counts. Okay, I need the admin, I need the for loop, I need uh, test, and then it counts. And then it will give you a total depending on, on in which part of the program was every 20 milliseconds. The R profile name stores the R prof results in a particular file. R prof null turn off the profile. And as we say, you can read um, the file name. It is just easier to use summary R prof because it, it, it helps with the analysis. Uh, the results are given in data frames. Uh, total time and total percentage include the time spent within a function, including calls to other functions. Self time and self percentage indicate actually real time spent in each function, meaning that the self percentage should up to 100%, uh, given a take random, of course. Okay, but many of the things we, we already mentioned. Any, any questions about this? All right, we'll take that as a no. Now we are going to get the word. Um, with with the parallel implementations. So since 2011, there is a parallel package that has been part of the core R packages. And basically incorporates and supersedes a, a two old packages, multi-core and snow. So multi-core allow you to use, and, and I'm going to touch very quickly on some aspects of, of hardware in the computers. Multicore allow you to use multiple cores within a single unit, a single computer. Think about, um, think about your laptops nowadays, your workstations, even your cell phones. Nowadays, each of these devices has multiple cores, multiple what we call CPU, central processing units. And sometimes some programs can run just in one CPU at a time, and other programs can spread computations across different CPUs within the same device. So the multi-core package basically allow you to do that. R by default, unless that you are using a package that is linked with other libraries that allow you to do that, will, won't do that, will not do that. So the multi-core package allow you to do that. Let's say you need to compute the average between thousand different uh, agents, then you can spread across your different cores and then get your computation done faster because you are doing computations in parallel. You have many elements working for you. The Snow package, what does is to spread this computation not only across the course within one computer, but let's say that you have a network of computers, you're in your lab and your colleagues give you uh, permission to use their own workstations and laptops, then you can spread the computation across these different computers. A more sophisticated and refined version of this is clusters like the Niagara cluster that sign it that can run uh, each node has 40 times two, basically 80 cores, and then has thousands of these nodes. So you can imagine running across that uh, humongous machine, very, very demanding computations. There are many other packages that allow you to use parallelism, but these are the very basic concepts. Uh, so just, just wanted to mention that. So let me show you, let me show you a quick example. And we're going to draw, again, go through the example just as a proof of principle and, and a show off of what you can do. I'm not expecting you to be experts on this. Of course, as I say, it will take several 
more lectures to understand what is going on, but at least give you the idea that this is possible if you are facing a calculation, if you need to deal with data, but it takes too long to run, may, you may need to end up going through one of these packages through this row. So this is type of looking at the Paladel package and two main uh, functions or applications, M MC Parallel and MC Collect. And MC, as you can guess, it stands for multi-core. So this is within the same device, but with multiple cores. So this is something that you can even implement or try in your own computers. So what I'm going to get is some data from a colleague of mine. This is data from, um, I believe the month of June 1998 of all the um, flights in the United States. Okay, so it's, it's a CSV file, it's, 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 it's quite big file. And we're going to go through a couple of things. So because we load the parallel function, now we have what we call the MC parallel function. Sorry, we load the parallel package. So now we have a, a bunch of MC functions, the MC parallel and, and so what we're going to do here is call NC parallel and then whatever function we want to run in our data set. So in this case, I want to run the length, meaning how many elements are in the unique of the sorting of the data set and the tail number. The tail number is a unique ID for planes. So basically what I'm counting here is how many unique planes there are. But I'm counting those in a parallel frame, in a parallel manner, meaning I took the original data set by using MC parallel, I was able to spread this data set in the different cores. So each of these cores will be doing the same task, but in a different chunk of the data. Okay. Similarly, if I want to compute the median, I will look at the elapsed times. So this is the actual elapsed times, meaning how long a particular plane to, to flew from um, airport in Los Angeles to JFK or La Guardia or whatever. And now I'm going to compute this, this median values. So you will do this, you could in, in, in general, you could do just median of the time and then na.rm uh, for remove in case that there are NAs and probably there are and just get that. But by doing MC parallel now, this computation is spread across the different cores. Finally, this what does is not give you the result directly, but if it, it launches the computation. If you want to actually get the result, what we need to do is MC collect. So basically I'm collecting the results from, from my workers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to collect in a list of, and now the list of the variables that I require, I require to, to compute. So unique planes and median elapsed. So when I do that and I see at, <clears throat> excuse me, at the answers variable that contains this, what I guess is two outputs. And I tell you in a second why the outputs are, so these are named lists, as you can see, if you remember from our second or third lecture. Uh, the first one with how many unique planes there are. The second one is with the uh, mean uh, time lapse of the, of the flight. And these numbers are nothing else than what we call the process ID. So whenever we start a computation, the operating system keep track of this computation by, by giving them an ID, a tag. And, and these are the tags associated with each of these computations. And that's why they are named in that way. Okay. But again, the, the powerful thing here is to notice that these were running parallel across the same cores or the different cores on the same node. So it's very quite straightforward to implement. Okay. Any questions about this? Okay, so in order to convince ourselves, let's let's try let's try <clears throat> let's try a fit on the data. Okay, we did this a couple of, of, of weeks ago with the LM function. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to create two fits. Um, the distance as a function of the of the time the airplanes uh, flew and the arrival delay as a function of the departure delay, meaning these are the, the, the delays in arrival related to departure or not. Data is coming from the same thing. So we, we measure, so this is where the, the performance come into place for profiling the codes comes into place just to have a hand on uh, and see, okay, are we improving or not? So we're going to use system time just for simplicity's sake. 
and, and call to these functions, it takes roughly, uh, what is that, 0 0.32 and, and 0 0.2 uh, seconds. The, the, so the total time, if you wish, is around 0 0.46 seconds, something that probably you won't spend much time uh, parallelizing. But again, this, this, can, this is just as, as a test case, if you wish. Now, let's see how we can perform this uh, in parallel. So in, in this case, I'm going to create the function part fits, and I'm going to receive the data sets, and, and p fit one is the first fit, and fit, p fit two is the second fit, and then at the end of the function, we are going to issue the mc collect uh, command we saw before, and then return uh, that, that as, uh, as the output. Now, if I run the system time um, with the function part fits with the data from June 1998, one surprising thing is um, we are taking a little bit more of time. And this is something that usually happens. You, you shouldn't be surprised by this or not too surprised by this. Uh, and the reason is whenever we spread, I told you what happened here is we have several cores in the computer and now each core is given a piece of the data. Right, and this is called for working on this piece of the data. The the operating system and R together had to distribute the data to the different cores. So this takes some time. This is called overhead time. In addition to that, forking, spreading the processes, indicating okay, core one do this fit, core two do this part of the fit, core three do this other part. This is called forking. This also takes some time. The lesson to to be learned here is that when we parallelize these processes, there is always an overhead time that is associated with that. Now, when you see things like this, when you see that the parallel time that takes to run your computation takes longer than the serial time, what this can be is a sign that your, your problem size is not big enough, meaning you don't have enough data to keep your course busy, or you don't have enough data to actually compensate for the time that it took to launch the processes and, and, and disperse the data and bring back the results. Again, this is something that can be significantly mitigated by having a larger data set. But basically the structures, the infrastructure for running in parallel is already in place. Okay. I know it's not the most compelling argument for trying something in parallel, but trust me, you will see improvement as soon as you crank up the size of the data. <clears throat> now let's talk about another of the NC functions that come with this parallel package. And you may recall just by looking at the name, this function is called MCL apply. It works exactly the same or very similarly to our apply family functions. And we talk at that time, the apply family functions were already improved for performance. Now you can imagine that the improvement goes one degree further because not only improves the performance, but also spread to different cores. So we are going to go back to this admin function. And now we are going to do something else in, in addition to the bar, to, sorry, to add the, the uh, numbers, we are going to divide. Divide uh, divisions in general are one of the most expensive computations in, in or operations in, compu in, in, in computing. So you, one tries to avoid them as much as possible, but here I'm making it on purpose so that there is some, some substantial or, or a little bit more of work to do. So if we try now, um, the, the, um, we are going to, time two different things. We're going to type the MCL apply, and I'm going to create a vector with, uh, again, 100,000 repetitions. Uh, and then one, this is one parameter that you can specify in how many cores you want to run. Usually you may want to run in as many cores as the computer have, or if you are sharing the computer with someone else in a restricted number of cores, but that's something that you can control. So in this case, I'm setting the number of cores to four, and then I'm running. So in this case, it takes me to run MCL apply roughly 2.5 seconds. Now, if we use L apply, the time goes to 9.5 seconds. So substantially better than just using L apply and, and uh, in this case, MCL apply, okay? So again, the MCL apply is one of the super powerful functions that you can, uh, you can use when performing things in, in, in parallel. 
One thing that you will notice, this is an output of a command called top that you run, or you can, depending on what you're doing, in which operating system you're doing, you can access similar, similar reports using the, um, um, I think it's called process manager um, in the Mac. I don't remember how it is called, probably similarly in, in Windows, but basically it's a, it's, a, it's a screen report in which processes, which programs are running, uh, program manager, I think in Windows. And, and in this case, one of my, my colleagues was running the MCL apply, and you can see that there are several instances, four instances. One is related to the main, main stream of R, but then the other are the MCL apply launches in four cores of, of this instruction. Okay. So quick, quick summary of the parallel multi-core package. Uh, the, any of the MC routines uh, in parallel work particular way when you want to make full use of the processors on a single computer, and each task only reads from one big common data structure and, produ and, pro and produces uh, model size results. Things to consider or to keep an eye on is uh, if you modifying the, the, the big data structure won't be seen by other processes. So this is usually referred as race condition. It's a new type of blood that crawls into the parallel implementations, um, but it also can blow up the memory requirements very easily. So that's also to keep an eye how much memory are you using. And that's why the first part of this lecture is just to keep an eye on, on the memory utilization. Um, unfortunately, um, it won't work on Windows machine because I don't think the, the operating system supports this sprawling of, of, the, of the processes. Someone told me there is a way to make it work a couple of months ago. I haven't tested myself, but you may find a way to, to, to make it work for Windows. Uh, uh, don't worry about, about this last comment. It's a little bit more technical, but remember that you can control this with MC cores, okay? All right, we have a few more minutes to go. And a last topic I want to cover, which is the compiled languages or compiled code. So we talk about the difference between R, which is an interpreted languages, and another compiled languages like C or Fortran. So the question or, or the point here is that it is possible indeed to interface your R code with compiled language. Why one would, would like to do that? Well, there are a couple of things. If you manage to implement things in a compiled language or you find a library or you find a code or someone give you a code that runs doing what you need to do, well, we talk about using libraries. That is along those lines. And of course, you have to trust the code that you were given, um, but going to keep that on a side. Uh, so a compiled implementation is faster. Compiled code is always faster than interpreted code. You can get the slowest part of your code into a compiled language, then you can leave the rest in R for, for uh, other purposes. R comes with the ability to buy compile specific functions. We're going to see this very quickly. It's also possible to write your own C++ or Fortran functions to, prefers, uh, to interface with R, but that can be a little bit more tedious. It is easier to use the RCPP package uh, to do that. And this package will allow you to easily interface with the C code as we're going to see in a few examples, okay? So let's talk about by compilation first. So the library that you want to use is compiler. Um, is, is, is something that comes with R because R does this most of the times automatically. We are going to bring the micro benchmark uh, library just for, for um, comparisons for profiling reasons. And this is a flag um, that we're going to take from the configuration that you may be running. The function is called enable sheet, uh, just in time compilation. Um, and, and, and we're going to set to zero. So that's the old value sheet or, or the predefined value. We are going to define a function that again, that's, that's a sort of division similar to the one I, I, I defined before. The only thing I changed A by, by X in this case. Uh, but the same thing, it's, it's a expensive computation. And the function that you want to use to compile, to buy compile your functions is called CM fun for compile function. And I call this LF, and then I assign to N a given value, 100,000. And then we are going to micro benchmark the function F and the function LF, which is the buy compile function. Now, if you do that, you will see 
that the by compile function is significantly faster. It's almost at least seven, eight times faster than the no by compile function. Okay. Now you may wonder, you may wonder why R does not do this by default. And I tell you what, in many cases, R does it by default. It doesn't do it if the function is too lightweighted. It means, okay, I don't really need to do that. Um, but if you use it multiple times, then it will do it by default. As a matter of fact, I believe that the, the, the standard behavior now is to compulsively do it by default. And that's why we are setting enable sheet to zero just to stop that behavior. Now, the question is why you would do that, like to do that? Well, first is to compare as we're doing here. Second is, if you are developing and your function is very, very uh, demanding in terms of how many lines and it's getting lengthy, you may not want to spend time in our by compiling the function at the first, the first time because, you know, it will take time from your debugging and, and developing process. So, you know, it's always a little bit of here and there that you need to, to be looking at, okay? So a few comments, by compiling is not the same as actually compiling code as it's done with compiled languages. By compiling creates what we call a byte object, which is executed by a virtual machine. And compiled languages are compiled into machine code, which is directly used by the hardware. So again, compiled languages are still, should still be faster than by compiled objects. Nonetheless, by compiling can be significantly faster than running the code flow they are interpreted as long as we just saw. If you run a function multiple times, R will automatically by compile your function. Something that you may notice is, if you, let's say that you define your function and then you call your function without the arguments, without the parentheses, R will basically repeat the function to you. But at the end, the last line may or may not say by compile and then some, some share on that put there. But basically that is the, the, the clue that are basically by compile your function. As I say, many of, most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, R will do that for you. Automatic by compiling, because of the reasons I mentioned before, if you decide to do so, you can do it by enable sheet function, just in time compile. Although it's not recommended, obviously, because you won't by compile your functions. But if you want to test, that's one of the things you want to do. Okay. Any questions about this? before I move to the very last topic today. All right, so the last topic for today is including compiled languages and in particular C language into R. Uh, the first thing you will need to do is to install this RCPP package, it stands for R, C++, and um, it will take some time. It's not a default package, oops, sorry, I don't know what happened there. Uh, sorry about that. I think I got excited with, um, at least in my computer, you is, is zoom out, <laughs> it's basically split. Uh, as I was saying, um, RCPP is not a default package in R, so you will need to install it. It will take some time, in particular, if you are using Windows, you will need to also download R tools. Okay, so again, this may take some time, not the, probably the, the best moment to do it right now, but if you decide to try the, the examples, which I invite you to do, um, you will need to follow this, this process of installation. Okay, now using RCPP, well, after this installed, it's like any other package in R, you just load it with library RCPP. And now what we are going to do is we are going to define some functions, but with a new nomenclature. So the function we are going to use is called CPP function. That's a function from the RCPP package. And what it allow us to do is to include definitions from actual C functions. Now, you can see the call to the function is a long, quite long string. Start with this quotation mark and with the quotation mark here. And then what it comes is the definition in CPP, in C++. So it starts with int, which refers to integral type. The name of the function is times. Then between parentheses comes the arguments to the function, similarly as we had arguments to our own functions in R, but also decorated by int. Int in this case is refers to the type. Remember, in, we talk about these compiled languages, 
Don't pre-assume that you can change types dynamically. You need to st stick to a given type. So the type of this function is an integer. So this function will return an integer. The type of the variables of these functions are integers as well. X and Y are integers. Then it starts a curly brace similar to our call blocks in R, open and close. So this is the function definition. We need to define a variable called product, the product of X and Y in this case. And it's going to be an integer type. So that's why the int is in front of product. And then we are assigning what is, what is product. It's the product of x times y. You will notice the semicolons. This is mandatory in the C language. Every time you break a line, you, you end a function call or a command, you put semicolon and go to the next line. And this is our return statement, similarly to what we have in our R functions. And we are returning the result of the product and then semicolon and we close the function. So in this way, we have defined a function called times. It's defined in C language. It's pure C or C++, if you wish. And now by using the CPP function from the RCPP package, we can just call the times function. And then times 34, 4 is 136, which we can obviously verify is the right result by doing 34 times 4. Obviously, this case may not be the most meaningful or, or interesting one to implement, but this is just a proof of concept that you can do that by using uh, C language within R. Okay. So I, I mentioned many of the things. Um, I think there are a couple of interesting features that there is a way to translate different types in R to types in C because C doesn't have all the types that we have in R like data frames and lists and even vectors are, are deal differently in, in C language. So there are a list of different types that you can use, okay? This is another example. And this is a, an example that is more along the lines of how you will use this in the real world, uh, not just defining, because honestly, it doesn't make too much sense to define just a function in R, um, in CPP, Usually what you will do is you will create, like we have the utility files, the main driver script, you will create a function with your C functions, or sorry, we will create a file with your C functions. So for instance, this is my RCPP code, dot .cppp, that's the name of the file. And then here is pretty similar to the structure that we have with our utility files, so main driver scripts in R, but in CPP, in C. So this hashtag include is similar to our library. So in this case, we are including the rcpp.h. These are called header files, unlike the packages in, in C. And then we are going to do something uh, called using namespace. So that is to, to short, uh, to basically don't have to write a lot of things. Uh, the comments in C, uh, differently than in R, that they start with the hashtag, it starts with two slashes. So these are comments. Uh, similar here, similar here. Now this comment has a particular uh, implication. It means that these functions, because it starts with bracket, bracket, RCPP, uh, colon, colon, export, means this function is going to be exported into the R uh, environment. And this is nothing else than the function that we just defined in the previous example. It's our times function. And we are just doing that. Now, this is an, a separate file, which, as I say, is, is more useful. It's the way that you usually will use this. So how we do this in the R, how we made the connection between R and this function define a separate file? Well, we are going to load, again, the RCPP function. And instead of using, uh, as we were using before, the CPP function function, we are going to now use the source CPP function. And what we are going to indicate is the name of the file where we have defined our C functions. Okay, we do that and then the times function is available for us. So the source CPP works very similarly to the source uh, command, but instead of sourcing R files, we are now sourcing CPP file. Okay, any questions about this? And again, these are the very basic of how you are going. I'm not teaching you basically how to write code in C++, but again, some of the things are quite similar, are very, very straightforward. One of my colleagues likes to say that once you, you learn a programming language, you are 
80 to 90 percent uh, in any other programming language. It's knowledgeable in any other programming language because the, the basic idea, the basic concepts are the same. You only need the only thing you need to do is, is a translation. It's, it's even easier than le learning a, a different language of ourselves because in the languages are more complicated structures you need to repeat. In programming languages, it's very structured. It's very, very, very well defined. So there are not so many ambiguities or something like that. Okay. So let me show you another example and a reason why we may want to do that. I may, I may go a little bit quick or, or faster in this, in this example. This is another uh, RCPP code. So it's, it's, a, it's another file where we are defining, in this case, another function. It's a little bit more, more involved, this function, and I tell you what it's doing. So we are including, we are loading the rcpp.h library in the, in, the C, in the C code using the same trick. So we don't need to, to, to do this. This is something R does automatically. We never went into this. It's called namespaces. Uh, you can call libraries without, without specifying the name of the functions. In any case, we are going to export the following function to our R environment. It's called mysum, and it receives a vector. So this is why it's called numeric vector, two numeric vector, x and y. Okay. And this is, I'm telling you what this function is going to do. It's just going to add two vectors, nothing else than that. Okay. And it's going to return. Um, sorry, it's going to add two vectors and multiply them. So it's, excuse me. Multiply the, the elements of the vector and add them. It's nothing else than the inner product that we saw in R, and we are going to compare these two. So what we're going to do in this case, uh, we're going to return just one number, and, and it's a double, so it's a real number. So that's the type the function will return. So one thing that C doesn't know at all, at all, is uh, the size. So it doesn't know how many elements a vector has. So we need to define that, and for getting how many elements we use the, uh, it's called the function member size. So X, which is a vector, has a function member dot size. So this tells you how many elements it has. Then we're going to create what we call a cumulative variable. We saw this in one of the assignments. It's going to be initialized with zero. And then we are going to loop. We're going to loop, remember looping? We're going to loop over each single element in the vectors. We are going to multiply them. And then this symbol means add to whatever was stored in answer, in the variable answer. So the looping is a little bit different from what we saw in R. Uh, it give you the initial condition, it give you add to when, and then it give you the rule for in, uh, incrementing the step. So in this case, it starts with the variable i, which is an integer. So we need to define the variable, that's why int, goes up to the value of i smaller than n uh, until the last element, and then add one to y. So it starts in i equals zero, does the computation for the element zero of the vectors, uh, check the condition, is i smaller than the uh, uh, length of the vector? Yes, then increments i in one. So i has the value of one and keeps doing. One difference also between vectors in R and C is that vector indexing in, in C starts at zero. So a vector of length n goes from index zero up to n minus one. That's why the condition doesn't include n. Okay, but that is more a technicality. And at the end, we return the value of the calculation that as I promise you, this is the same as writing answer equal answer plus X of I times Y of I. So this symbol allow us to compactify the annotation. That's kind of why the, the C++ also because C++ here it means I equal I plus one, okay? So that is a word C function, nothing else than doing the inner product. So taking two vectors, multiply in each of the elements and then add them all together. And then at the end, get just one number for the whole computation. So let's see how that compares to the implementation in R. So we're going to load our library RCPP. We are all going to source our my RCPP code 2.cpp, which is the file right here. And then we're going to load the library micro benchmark for the profiling. Now, uh, X and Y are going to be two random numbers with a million elements. So X is a, a million uh, random numbers, Y a million of random numbers. And then we are going to micro benchmark the MySum function, that's the one in, implemented in C++. And then we can implement this calculation in, in, in a very simple manner in, 
in, in R. We can use the sum of X times Y. So X times Y is the vectorized way of doing this and sum is the operation over that. So this is a vectorized operation in R, which is one of the preferable ways of doing things in R in terms of performance. And then again, we want to see the results in units of microseconds. So when we run down the unit is milliseconds, so <laughs> milliseconds. And then we have our two functions the uh, C++ implementation and the R vectorized implementation. And you can see, you can see that it's astonishing in this simple example, the speed up of the C++ implementation is roughly a factor of three faster than the, R, the best R implementation possible. And so this is the reason why people still uses this when dealing with performance. When you really want to, to get the last drop of performance in your possible implementation, when you are struggling for faster times for running your computation faster, well, that's, that's why you do this. And this is the most simple case you could even think of, right? Or not, not sure the most simple case, but, but a very simple case. Okay. Um, this is another example uh, when you want to, um, use vectors and numbers, but same idea, you, you return a vector in this case, uh, it's, it's instead of returning just a number, I leave this up to you to go through it, but the main elements are, are the ones we just discussed. So just a quick summary, um, there is a very nice website, it, it's maintained by the Krantas View of High Performance and Parallel Computing that I would recommend you to look at if you're interested in, in, in these kind of things. Um, this is an important comment, save your, your function profiling until you know that the function works correctly. Don't, don't succumb to premature optimization. Uh, try the by compiling first. So these are different things. You can try different strategies, right? Um, don't be afraid of RCPP. I mentioned this once you, you learn a programming language, you are 80% in other programming languages. There are caveats there, but, but yeah. And, and this is just going into the final comments about the course. Feel free to any time, not only for the course, but any time that you're struggling with uh, some research project, some problem in R, anything related to computation, actually to, to drop us, drop me a, an email. I will be happy to, to try to help you. I, I have nice stories and I, and I tell about students that have come to me and we, we have started frightful, fruitful uh, collaboration. So don't, don't be afraid of that. I, I, I'm always keen to, to try to help you if, if, if I can, if I know what we're talking about, actually. Um, just a few final course, uh, a, a kind of wrap up of the course, if you wish. What we discover in this course, uh, what we discuss in this course, I should say, uh, well, a very, very quick introduction to programming. We, we spend some time discussing modularity and best practices basic elements in coding that are, as I say, are present in not only in R, but in all programming languages, loops, conditional functions. We talk about file input output operations, very important in R, slicing and vectorization, the apply family functions. We just cover a glance of statistics and models, but that is all about that. So you can spend your life digging into that visualization at the end some high performance R. What things we did not cover, I, I mentioned this through, through some of the lectures, but are as important, if not more in some cases, are uh, version control. I strongly recommend to use version control. It's, 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 it's something that is part of our day-to-day -day operations when we do computational research. Um, it will save your life more than once. It will make your, your work accessible to different resources. And is, is nowadays is going to be almost like mandatory for anyone doing uh, open science and, and robust science. So take a look at that. It's not difficult. You need to get into the, the habit of using it. I would love to, to have presented that, but because of the time constraints, we, we, we could. Uh, rounding screens from the command line and command line arguments, that's something big as well. It's, 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 it's generic to many different languages and, and are also allow us to do that. We haven't showed that. Uh, developing your own packages. After you implement the concept of modularity, you are 50% way of creating your own packages and then you can publish in the journals and, 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 and the current repository. The statistics that I mentioned are huge on that, machine learning and, and many other things. 
Now, my final, my final comment for you guys is, um, if you are interested in, in learning more about this, there may be more opportunity, there will be more opportunities coming down the road. Um, if you go to, to uh, designed.course's uh, website, you can see the updated list. We haven't posted it, it there yet, but every summer we used to have a one week uh, summer school. That was until last year uh, when the pandemic hit all of us and, and, and like uh, in presence uh, activities were canceled. But what we did was to switch to our online, uh, virtual online um, approach uh, or modality. So now what we have is a virtual summer training program that runs from June up to August or, or roughly around the, that time. Uh, as I say, we haven't still decided the starting date, but we are going to have it this year. And it goes through all kinds of, of uh, different topics. So as a, as a, if you want to take a look at that, you can go to this one. This is from last year, and you will see we, we range from supercomputing topics, uh, advanced R, up to uh, biomedical topics. So there's, there's a great variety of topics. All of them counts towards data certificate credits. So that's a way to, to keep accumulating credits if you're interested in that. OK, with all that said, and um, I give you a minute while I pull the assignment for this week, the last assignment, the final sixth assignment. Um, give you a minute to think if you have any questions. Let's see. There we go, here we go. So let me share my screen again so we can discuss the final assignment. So this is our final assignment for the course. And it's, it's, I, I hope again, it's a, it's, a, it's a funny one for you guys. It's supposed to be too, too difficult. It will combine two topics, which I think are, one is important, the other definitely interesting, is NetCDF and mobile generation. So the idea here is I'm giving you a NetCDF file it has uh, simulated data, mock data, actually, from two neutron stars. It's a binary system of neutron stars. We can see the plot here. This is the X and Y coordinates in the orbital plane. And then this is time. So usually one thing that we do is we measure time um, in negative numbers, meaning at zero is when the stars merge and, and previous times are negative. So time up to the merge, so minus 10. 10 millisecond previous to the merge is where you start your, your data and then it goes all the way up, up to the merge that happens at t equals zero. So the, the, uh, the task for you in this case is to, okay, read the data, identify what variables and what vectors are stored in the data, and then produce a movie similar to, to the one that I, I have for you here. Uh, so this is a movie where there are three panels. I'm asking you at least for two panels. You don't need to do the three panels, but if you want, you can do three panels, um, but at least two panels. One is the trajectories, for instance. The other is the electromagnetic luminosity or the gravitational wave signal of the, of the, of the produced by this binary neutron star system. So the, the in, 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 in concrete, what I want you to do is to create, again, a main driver script and a utility files and then uh, the main driver script should define a function that receives two arguments, the name of the data set and the name of the file with the movie that you're going to generate. And then the utility file will contain at least two functions, one that reads the data, uh, receiving obviously the name of the data to be read, return in a particular way the data, it can be a list, uh, you need to figure it out. And then the second function will generate the movie receiving the data from uh, the reading data function, okay? One important thing is you need to implement defensive programming to be sure that the data file exists. That's the only constraint with respect to, to um, uh, defensive programming. The other thing you need to bear in mind is in order to generate the movie, you will need to install FFpeg. And uh, this is a link, it's very, Simple to install, you may run into some issues depending on the operating system. If that's the case, just shoot me an email, I can try to guide you through that process, but it should be, should be pretty benign, I would say, nothing too, too complicated, okay? So that's the last assignment, all right?
any any questions about the lecture, the assignment, the course in general? And is it due? It is due in two weeks from now, meaning on May twenty fourth at midnight. Yeah, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. Yeah, Jessica. All right. Well, if you guys don't have any any questions, first of all, I want to thank you for for attending the course. is is uh, definitely something. So we are modality, I have to tell you. I, I really enjoy interacting with people face-to-face -face in this type of courses. Um, but I appreciate you guys being here every Monday and, and some of you during the office hours. So it has been a pleasure for me. And as I said before, if you have any questions about the course or anything, let's just, just free, uh, feel free to, to reach out. Thank you, Sharon. Okay, and uh, we are going to still have the office hours. As I mentioned, I may need to move the one coming on this, uh, this coming Friday. But I let you know, and let me know if you guys have any preference on having it on Thursday or Monday. It's the same for me. It's just that Friday looks a little bit complicated right now. Okay, thank you, Peter. Okay, I think I think this is it. We we did it, team. <laughs> Congratulations. We still have one more assignment to go, but it's almost there. All right. Okay. So with that say, um, thank you again, and I see you soon. Thank you, Shani.